بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات والله بما تعملون خبير صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد أيها الأستاذ الحضور نوجه التحية لكل ضيوف مؤتمرنا الكرام أسعدتمونا اليوم بحضوركم في مؤتمر الجراحة الأول وفي هذا المكان الذي يتشرف بجميع الموجودين من أصحاب الكفاءات والقامات العلمية الكبيرة وذوي العقول النيرة نسلط الضوء على مسألة لطالما شغلتنا جميعا ألا وهي سرطان الثدي وللأعراب عن ترحيبنا بحضوركم ننصت وإياكم لكلمة عميد كلية الطب الجامعة الليبية الدولية الدكتور جمال الطلحي تشرف أن يكون موجود في اليوم العلمي لقسم الجراحة بكلية الطب والذي يتمنى أن يكون ناجحا كما نتوقع الحقيقة وفرصة سعيدة أن نشوف بعض الوجوه اللي ما شفتهاش من مدة طويلة جدا أنا متأكد أن حنستمع لعدد من المحاضرات القيمة واللي حنستفيد منها بشكل كامل وأتمنى أن الزخم الموجود هذا أنا كنت نحكي مع الدكتور محمد والدكتور هيثم خلال الأسابيع الماضية كان في زخم يعني لنشاطات علمية في بنغازي وفي ليبيا بشكل عام كل الأقسام تقريبا شفت الـ 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 الجراحة الجلدية الباطنة الأقسام مختلفة في كل مكان الحقيقة وهذا يتلج القلب لأن هذه كل كلمة تقال قد يستفيد منها شخص ما بطريقة أو بأخرى أتمنى أن الزخم هذا يستمر النشاط يستمر بشكل كامل ونرحب بكم في الجامعة الدولية في أي وقت يكون في أي نشاط يستفيد منا الجميع يستفيد منا الأطباء يستفيد منا الطلبة يستفيد منا الخريجين جدد يستفيد منا أي قطاع من قطاع الصحة نحن داعمين لهذا الأمر بشكل كامل أتمنى أيضا أن أن أي نشاط علمي مستقبلي يكون للأطباء الجدد دور فيه سواء كان في تنسيق سواء كان في حتى إلقاء بعض المحاضرات أو عروض بعض البحوث آه نحن في, في الكلية الطب حقيقة آه نفتخر آه آه بما وصلنا إليه من ناحية تطوير آه آه قدرات الطلبة آه جهد بسيط وجامعة صغيرة ولكن تمكنت على الأقل في مدة وجيزة أن آه تحدث بصمة في التعليم الطبي بشكل أو بآخر آه أنا سعيد جدا أن آه كلية الطب تعتبر هي الكلية الوحيدة آه في ليبيا إن لم يكن في شمال أفريقيا اللي طالب الطب مطالب بمشروع تخرج وهذا اتجاه جديد لأهمية البحث العلمي وأهمية أن الطالب اللي تخرج يجب يجب أن يكون مستعد للسوق المتطلبات السوق العالمي. نحن نشأنا في بيئة أن خريج الطب لما يتخرج يكون مؤهل ويقدر يجتاز امتحاناته وهذا هذا سير نحن عندنا الآن ضيوف ما زالوا يعني يعملون بالخارج. لأن إمكانياتهم كانت عالية وتمكنوا من أنهم يجاروا نظرائهم في هذه الدول لكن متطلبات السوق العالمي الآن اختلفت تماما عن السابق لا يكفي أن تكون خريج كلية الطب يجب أن تكون عندك إمكانيات أكبر من ذلك بكثير إمكانيات تتعلق بالبحث العلمي إمكانيات تتعلق بخبرتك خلال فترة الدراسة سواء كان الخدمة المجتمعية سواء كان نشاطات أخرى كثيرة والطالب اللي او الخريج اللي حيعمل بعد 20 سنه مش هو الخريج اللي يعمل الان، بعد 20 سنه المتطلبات حتكون مختلفه، نحن نسمع على الاي اي واصبح جزء مهم جدا 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 من البراكتس لاي طبيب او خريج، اعتقد ان الطبيب اللي يتخرج ولا ما يعرفش شو معناها الاي اي واستخدامه في الطب او ما يقدرش على التكنولوجيا او ما يكونش اكسبرت في هاو تو يوز التكنولوجي في الميديكال فيلدز ما يعرفش يتحدث بشكل جيد علميا في المحافل العلميه ما البرزنتيشن سكيلز تكون ضعيفه البيرسوناليتي بتاعها تكون مش ماتيور هذا لن يستطيع باي شكل من الاشكال ان ينافس في السوق الدولي نظراء كثيرون ولكن نحن بدينا نشوف الثمار هذا الاتجاه اللي الحقيقه اهتمت به الجامعه الدوليه ثمار خرجينا انهم تمكنوا على الاقل من النجاح في امتحانات كثيره جدا متطلباتها تختلف وقد يكون التحدي القادم هو ان نحن نتمكن من تخريج اطباء يعني قادرون على التكيف مع ظروف التغير السريعه، نحن نسمع على الاي اي وبعدين ممكن نديروا نشاط علمي او اثنين او ثلاثه وننسوه، لكن العمل في هذا المجال في كل انحاء العالم مستمر كل يوم وبشكل سريع. يعني الا كان ما قدرناش يعني نلحق على التغيرات هذينا ونخلي اولادنا 
يعني ماشيين في هذا الاتجاه حنصبح برضو دولة متخلفة للأسف برغم قناعتنا اللي هي خلينا نسموها فورس بليف ان احنا اب تو ديت في كل شيء ما زال العمل الحقيقة يحتاج لكثير من الجهد في كثير من الاستقرار في الدولة الليبية اصبح ومع في عذر ان التعليم الطبي اللي هو اهتمامنا بشكل خاص والتعليم بشكل عام يتطور انا تأسف لما نشوف الحقيقة يعني مناهج دراسية يعني خلاص يعني اكل عليها الدهر والشرب طرق تعلم يعني غير 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 ناجحة وقديمة ما نحكيش بس على مستوى الجامعات لكن نحكي على مستوى حتى التعليم الأساسي البوتنشل عند الطلبة عالي جدا وللأسف لما يلقوا بيئة غير محفزة بيئة تعتم على التلقين والتحفيظ حنحطوهم في خانة يعني قد لا تليق بمستواهم اللي أساسا هم يعني المفروض يكونوا فيه أتمنى لكم نجاح ما بتطيل عليكم وأتمنى تذكير بس للزملاء الموجودين اليوم أتمنى أن يكون اهتمام بالخريجين جدد بشكل كامل هؤلاء هم من سيقومون بالعمل في مستشفياتنا ومفرقنا الصحية هؤلاء هم من يعالجوننا في المستقبل هم هذول الحالة يجونا قوم قدامنا يعني فإن لم نهتم بتدريبهم وتطويرهم بالشكل الصحيح العلمي ما نتكلمش فقط بالبيرسون اكسبيرينس لكن نحكي الأساس العلمي الصحيح سننشئ جيل ضعيف جيل غير قادر جيل متكرر في بعض أخطاء فالاهتمام بالجيل الجديد وتنشئته ولو بشكل شخصي هذا حيساعدك وساعد كل شخص منا أن يشوف المنتج اللي قدامه بعدين يعني ونتائج عمله أتمنى لكم النجاح ونحن نتطلع اليوم عن ميحاف إن شاء الله شكرا جزيلا كمقدمة سريعة على موضوع اليوم Breast cancer is a disease in which abnormal breast cells grow out of, the, out of control and form tumors. If left unchecked, the tumors can spread throughout the body and become fatal. Breast cancer cells begin inside the milk ducts and or the milk producing globules of the breast. The earliest form, which is the in situ, it is the, uh, li- it's, it's not life threatening and can be detected in early stages. Cancer cells can spread into nearby uh, breast tissue which is called the invasion. These create tumors that can lumps or thicken. Invasive cancers can spread to nearby lymph nodes or other organs, which is can metastasize, and this can be a life-threatening and fatal. Treatment is based on the person, type of cancer, and the uh, stage of spreading. Treatment combines surgery, radiation therapy, and medication. عشان تعرفوا أكثر على حدث اليوم نتطرق وإياكم لأولى فقرات هذا الحدث نبدأ أول فقراتنا اليوم ب as a first presenter going to be دكتورة ريحاب شنبش دكتورة ريحاب متحصلة على درجة ماجستير في طب الأورام الحديث من جامعة يولم الألمانية دكتورة ريحاب عضو في الجمعية الأمريكية لطب الأورام السريري أسكو وكذلك عضو في الجمعية الأوروبية لطب الأورام اسمه دكتور يحاب رئيس العلمي لمنظمة كيور فاونديشن ولديها نشاطات علمية وبحثية منها lung cancer in eastern part of Libya and breast cancer in eastern Libya دكتور يحاب She's going to present us today the role of multidisciplinary team in breast cancer management. أول حاجة حابة نشكر دكتور هيثم اللجنة العلمية والمنظمة على الدعوة أكيدا وعلى أنهم عطوا الوقت لموضوع مهم اللي أنا أعتقد أنه هو most important part for modern treatment of breast cancer. وللأسف وجدي ما زال ما يعرفوش على الموضوع هذا. فا in the next few minutes we're going to talk about the multidisciplinary team in breast cancer and why is it crucial. crucial for modern treatment. First, if we look in the back of the days, at the beginning of 20th century, we can see that infectious disease was the most common cause of death in humanity, representing about 2 million population. At the mid to the late 20th century, with the introduction with the antibiotic, the non-communicable disease and the cardiovascular disease has become the main killer of humanity. If we see in this graph, we can see in the 20th century, the infectious disease must the most common cause of death. 
by the beginning of 21st century, the mortality in general has been decreasing and declined to more than 50%, as I said, because of the introduction of the antibiotic. And the more chronic disease, such as the cardiovascular heart and cancer, became the main cause of death in humanity. What about the 21st century? We can see, according to the uh, global data at the beginning of the 21st century, and of first data we have of GlobalCon 2008, has uh, shown that the cancer has become the main killer, in which about estimated new cases was about 12 million and the death uh, 7 million. And the main cause of death seen was mainly due to lung, breast, and colorectal cancer and uh, represent about 18% per of all deaths in, uh, in 2008. What about, uh, and, and that time, at the beginning of 21st century, in the male population, prostate cancer was the most commonly diagnosed cancer, especially in the highly developed countries. And of course, breast cancer was the most commonly diagnosed cancer all over in female. What about the news data we have in GlobalCan 2020? If we can see on the left side, we have the estimated new cases and incidence wise. And the cancer risk has risen into about 19 million new cases. And breast cancer has surpassed uh, lung cancer as the most commonly diagnosed cancer in both sex. What about the death? Also, the death rate has increased to about 10 million cases, with the lung cancer being the most commonly cause of death. If we can see in this graph in the, in the right side, we can see that breast cancer has dropped as the main cause of death into about the fourth and fifth and other malignancies are more killers. But unfortunately, this is only true in the highly uh, income countries or developed countries. If we see in this uh, map, we can see that the highly or advanced countries, main cause of killers in female is lung cancer. Whereas in the less developed countries, breast cancer is still the main killer. And in sub-Sahara Africa, cervical uh, cancer is the most common because of lack of vaccination. Breast cancer five-year survival differs according to where you're living, unfortunately. This is the reality we're living in. So if you're living in a high-income country, your survival rate is more than 90%. Whereas if you're living in Far East uh, Asia, like in India, it drops to 66%, in Africa, in less than 40%. And unfortunately, this is the reality we're living every day. If we look into the, uh, not all the data are grim and, and sad data. If we look at this uh, graph, and which shows the breast cancer survivor of the la over the last about uh, 50 years, especially in the US and UK, we can see there are drop in the mortality rates in the last uh, 10 years. And this is despite the increase of incidence of, of cancer in general and breast cancer. But the mortality is decreasing. And that's because of the screening uh, early diagnosis, education and adversary group in which educating the general population of, uh, about breast cancer and how it can be treated, also because of the best treatment option and better treatment options. But unfortunately, if we look at these graphs about the survival in stage four lung cancer over the last one year, three years, five years, and 10 years, we can see, unfortunately, there is no improvement. And still, the median overall survival for such patient is two to three years. We're trying with the modern treatment uh, to improve the survival and make uh, such a disease into a chronic disease. But unfortunately, we're still uh, far from that. Uh, uh, wh why do we need to do that? We have to know that in the prediction in the next uh, 20 years, the world cancer cases is going to increase by about 56%. And this is something we cannot reverse from 19 to about 30 million cases. And also meaning that one of two people will get cancer in a lifetime. This is expected in the next, next about 40 years. And unfortunately, also the mortality will increase by 64%. And the more grim data about that is that 70% of cancer-related death will occur in low to, uh, to middle-income countries, which is, uh, unfortunately, uh, Libya is part of that. Why do we need to know that? Because I believe that by discussing the cases, especially in the advanced stages or only also the early stage, we can reverse what's happening. We can not decrease the incidence, but we can reverse mortality, in which such uh, uh, picture we're seeing, which increase incidence and mortality, we try to at least uh, decrease the mortality and reverse this picture. And how we can do that, I think it's the most important part of it is the multidisciplinary team meeting. Uh, first of all, we, uh, what is the definition of MDT? Because a lot of people don't know the definition. In the UK, MDTs are mandatory by law, and every case of cancer has to be discussed 
and an MDT. So the general definition of MDT is a group of people of different health care disciplines meet together at a given time, either in person or by teleconferencing, and uh, discuss the given patient and can contribute independently for the best diagnostic and treatment option. What about breast MDT in specific? How we can define it? It's very simple. Breast MDT, the core membership include two breast surgeons, radio oncologists, and sub, uh, our clinical oncologists, medical oncologists, two specialists, and uh, two pathologists, two breast cancer uh, nurses, and also MDT coordinator. We have another what we call extended team, which should be included in every MDT, reconstruction and plastic surgeon, physiotherapist, uh, psychiatrist, and uh, of course, social worker. And I think all these uh, cores are important for uh, best MDT. What an MDT should not be, is a fighting between different disciplinary. We're not here to each person to show that he knows better or to force the, the idea. We're here to work together to try to get the best for the patient and to try to get the best decision. Uh, of course, the MDT can be done for all kinds of cancer, early breast cancer, locally advanced, or even metastatic, which will, which will help us also in clinical practice and also in research in the future. Uh, of course, the best option we have is a specialized center, which uh, will benefit from clinical approach uh, because it will improve the survival of the patient. And we're going to uh, talk about it a little uh, uh, later on. But unfortunately, there is a lack of randomized control trial that uh, will prove the efficacy of such, uh, 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 such uh, method. So, what are the key rules that are played uh, by the MDT? As we know, each member of the MDT have a unique knowledge and experience on, uh, gives his experience in the table, which will help develop a tailored treatment for the patient, which will help also uh, provide uh, ensuring all aspects of patient care has been taken and also uh, takes into the account the emotion and the social request by the patient. Meaning, by the MDT, we can tailor the treatment for the patient in all aspects, medical and psychological. What are the benefits for breast cancer patients of the MDT? Do the patient benefit? Of course, and, of, and the first point is the improved survival. And many studies have shown that the patient who are discussed in MDT will have a better quality of life and better outcome. And also, as we said, a more comprehensive care and personalized treatment choice for the patient ensure that the patient gets the best uh, treatment option. And of course, we have better communication. Unfortunately, we lack the communication between the patient and the supervising doctor. But what, with the MDT, uh, we can ensure that there is communication with the patient and different uh, throughout his treatment. The most important question, and a lot of doctors still don't believe in that, does the MDT really uh, affect or impact the survival of the patient? Of course, we have many patients, uh, we have many studies had that improved that there is a st statistically significant improvement in the, and the chance of living a better life by uh, discussing the patient of MTT, which leads to decrease in the breast cancer, specific mortality, and also the overall mortality. Also, the, as we said, there is a standard, standardized care, meaning that each, each patient will get his tailored treatment, minimizing the side effect and the bias that might happen if we consider all the patient one and treat them all as one, uh, as one patient. And that will help us to detect any kind of complication that will happen early on and uh, so we can deal with it early on. There's one uh, uh, study, which is an interventional cohort study of about 13,000 women was done in Scotland, and which compared the patients who were treated in the MDT, and it was found that after discussion in the MDT, there was about 18% uh, decrease in the mortality rate in the patients that were discussed in the MDT. And the most uh, important outcome was that all cases should be discussed in the MDT to decrease the mortality. Of course, there are a lot of barriers, and we can see them in our everyday practice. First of all, is the excessive caseload, the low attendance at the meetings, the lack of leadership, poor communication, uh, rule ambiguity, failure to consider the patient's need. So most important existing problems that MDTs are not universal. And we know that because, unfortunately, until now, we don't have an established MDT for breast. And uh, we lack national and international guidelines, or regional guidelines, I mean, sorry. Uh, that's the most important because sometimes, especially for us in the low-income countries, we cannot follow the international guideline because of the many factors. Also, uh, 
Unfortunately, most of these uh, meetings are only medically focused, and the role of the nurses, social workers, and palliative care uh, specialists uh, are not here. Uh, and most frequently, only the early breast cancer are diagnosed on the MDT. As we know, breast cancer has been very challenging, the treatment of it, as uh, ha, the, also the classification of breast cancer has changed over the last few years, in which the molecular classification classifies breast cancer into four main subtypes. That's very easily said, but each subtype is subdivided into many other subtypes. So if we say very basically, there are main four subtypes of breast cancer, triple negative, HER2, luminal A, and luminal B. And as we know, the main or the worst out outcome usually we see in the triple negative and the HER2 overexpression. And the treatment is very, ch very ch challenging, which is a mix of chemo, uh, radio, surgery, and the immunotherapies, and the target therapy, hormonal therapy. So it's not an easy decision that can be done by one person. We have to take into account many factors be before we take a decision for treating breast cancer patients, mainly hormone receptor, HER2 expression, previous therapies, the tumor burden, biological age and performance status, menopausal status, also the need of rapid response, the socioeconomic status as we have it most problem. And the most important thing that we mostly forget is the patient preference and the patient's need. Sometimes we tailor the treatment according to what the patient prefers. So if we take very, very simple example and very fast, the new adjuvant setting is the main uh, focus that we can see uh, the multidisciplinary team, uh, team playing its uh, most important role. So if we can say in the luminal subtype, as for now, we have what we call as the hormonal sensitivity test, in which we take a biopsy and give hormonal therapy for two weeks, and then we take another biopsy. And we can see here we have the role of the surgeon, the histopathologist, and the medical oncologist to decide the best treatment option. Also, if we decide on a systemic therapy, like chemotherapy, usually we give it for six months and then we operate. And also here we need the role of the histopathologist, molecular study, studies, and also the, the surgeons. Very, very, very fast. As we know, the indication for new adjuvant chemotherapy, especially for the bad subside, the HER2 uh, positive and triple ne negative has changed over the years. If we see over the last uh, two to three years, has changed tremendously. As we know, the main, main uh, indication for new adjuvant th therapy over the last 20 years has been for downstaging, and the patients who are not operable can be operable, and so we downstage the disease. But over the last few years, ha the indication has uh, changed, in which even T2 in zero tumor, meaning that less than two centimeter tumor, and also T1 in one, meaning less than two centimeter with positive lymph node, have been indication for new adjuvant chemotherapy. So if you don't know the guideline and the patient is not discussed in an MDT, if the patient presents to a breast clinic with a 1.5 centimeter lesion, they will lead, usually the surgeon will think it's a very early stage, I'll go ahead and operate. But unfortunately, if this patient is HER2 overexpression or triple negative, there is a strong indication for neoadjuvant. Why? Because it affects survival. And we're going to talk about that. So the indication in these kind of bad subtypes of breast cancer is from T1 to 4 clinically and lymph node from 0 to 4. So it's a very, very broad uh, indication for new adjuvant, and these cases need to be discussed in the MDT to we, so we can give the best tailored treatment. Why? Because the amount of PCR, which is the pathological complete response, it affects survival, and we have many studies proving that. But I just want this chart, one chart will prove something. If we can see the red color is the triple negative breast cancer who didn't achieve a PCR. PCR meaning pathological complete response after receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. And we can see that the survival of this subset of patients is very poor, down to 60%. Whereas the patient who, who achieved PCR, the survival rate will go up, up to 90%, which is a huge difference. In the luminal subtype, it, there is no big difference in which that's why it's indication for a new adjuvant in luminous subtype is very limited. But even with that, the patient who achieved PCR will do better generally in survival. Just very fast, one trial because I think it's very important and was uh, clinical practice is changing and I need the surgeons to know why we need to do the new adjuvants is the Katrin trial. And the Katrin trial is included uh, a patient with HER2 overexpression, locally advanced, or from T1, 4 to N0, N3, in which the patient received new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, with anti-HER2 therapy and then uh, they were operated. The patient who had a residual disease were randomized, either continue uh, with trastuzumab, which is the most commonly used anti-HER2 therapy, or to shift to another anti-HER2 therapy, which is the TDM, trastuzumab and mistine. 
just why do I need to know that? Because the invasive free survival curves has separated tremendously, in which the patient who received TDM1 improved the survival up to 90% compared to the patient with trastuzumab. Why did I present this? Because I want the surgeons to understand the importance of PCR as a surrogate for survival. We don't need to wait for three to five years to, uh, to know the survival of the patient. Just by the patient who achieved PCR, we know they are, have good survival, and we don't need to have post-surgery aggressive treatment. But the patient who do not achieve PCR, we need to change our systemic therapy to other kind. But if such a patient was operated first, I always say that the survival of the patient would drop tremendously because we do not know which patient will have poor response and we can give extended therapies. So my message and most important thing, do not operate on any patient until you have the immuno, until you discuss with the surgeon because otherwise you'll drop the survival of the patient and it's not, not, not fair for the patient. So very, very uh, briefly, when we discuss a patient in neoadjuvant, we have all the disciplinary we talk about. We need the radiologist for the diagnosis. We need the pathologist to read the pathology and the immuno. We need the surgeon for the surgery. Of course, we need the patient and the cooperation of the patient. We need the medical oncologist, the radiotherapist. And of course, we need the advocate and the, and the research because without the research, we don't know the future where it's going. What about the inoperable uh, uh, breast cancer? Of course, the rule here remains for systemic therapy. Uh, it's not about if you can operate or not operate. As uh, I always know, a lot of surgeons, they say, I can operate on any surgery. I know, we can operate any breast cancer, but will it benefit the patient in survival? That's the question we need to ask. So in the inoperable or locally advanced breast cancer, systemic therapy remains the main therapy. And then, of course, with the co coordinates with uh, later on methyl disciplinary if we need surgery or radiotherapy, but systemic therapy is the main. Of course, we know we have the uh, stage four cancer is the most uh, uh, cases not diagnosed, uh, unfortunately not uh, discussed in the MDT. Of course, it should be discussed because still there is a rule for local control on some patient. So the optimal collaboration is is needed and is crucial for the treatment and best expertise and best in each field will come together to try to benefit uh, and the patient and as one of the most one of the main leader of our breast cancer uh, leaders has said breast specialist and an expert in his and her discipline with average knowledge about any other uh, disciplines thank you very much the topics the modern surgical treatment of breast cancer and when we talk about breast cancer surgery, we're talking about breast surgery or axillary part. In the breast surgery part, we're talking about the mastectomy at the beginning, the partial mastectomy, then the lumpectomy. And in the axilla, either clearance or sentinel lymph node biopsy. In the history of mastectomy, if we want to talk about the, the new technique, we have to look in the past. In the past, the, the surgery started 3,000 years ago. They used a lot of uh, instrument or uh, devices helping them, like this one or that one, or the cauterization with fire, all to uh, cause a shrink in the breast cancer or gangrene at the end, and it will lead to a fall down of the breast tumor. Uh, in uh, 1894, Halstead recommended in-block resection, including the major muscles, pectoralis major and the minor, uh, and remove all the fascia, all the uh, skin in-block. Later on, in 1948, modified radical mastectomy was introduced <coughs> by Batty and Dyson. And we're still doing this type of surgery. Uh, we preserve the pectoralis muscles and we remove the breast and we do axillary clearance with that. In 1970, Mellon trials demonstrated no difference in five year survival rates between quadrandectomy with radiotherapy versus mastectomy. And this started a new era in the breast surgery uh, with the partial mastectomy or with lumpectomy alone. In 1962, Freeman first described skin sparing mastectomy, and this is a new one, a new technique. This is the in block technique of Halstead, removing the breast with the skin and the tumor and the muscles, leaving just the chest wall. This is the subcutaneous uh, mastectomy with non-nibble preserving, and this is with nibble preserving. 
After that, a new chapter started with oncoblastic breast surgery. Uh, the concept of that is so simple, and this is how can we remove a cancer achieving a satisfactory margin of normal tissue while at the same time making the patient look as good or even better than she looks before. This is started with the diagrams here. If you look here, this is all indicate where is the tumor. If the tumor in the upper half or in the lower half or in the central, what type of surgery we are going to do. For example, here we can do batwing or we can in the central, we can do grisati, inverted T. All are many types of surgery, including removal of the tumor with a safe margin and preserving the contour of the breast, the figure of the breast for the female. This help uh, encouraging the, the woman to do the surgery with, with, with courage and with satisfactory feeling after the surgery. Here we have, we did, we did the lumpectomy with too many techniques. Crescent mastopexy, we removed the uh, crescent incision, we removed the tumor through that, and when we close, there is no dimpling or a loss of tissue. We do the batwing mastopexy, removing part uh, of the breast larger than uh, the previous one, and we ended the result with a good cosmetic effect. Here we do the hemi batwing, and this is uh, used also in the uh, in the central breast when we start uh, when decided to remove the nipple areola complex. <coughs> Some surgery we do is the triangular resection. We're removing uh, part of the breast triangle complete, and we close. This will end with also a nice cosmetic effect and we don't uh, need to replace the volume we lost. This is here. This is the difference. Here we, we remove only the part, we reserve the nipple areola complex. Here we remove with the nipple areola complex. This is in the central uh, tumors, retroareolar tumors. Sometimes in, in other uh, uh, surgeries. When we do the surgery for one affected size, we needed to, to adjust the other side, and this is for the asymmetry. And uh, sometimes we use to do this surgery to help the radiotherapy after that, because in large breast sizes, the radiotherapy is very challenging. When we come to the axillary surgery, it's simple. Either we do axillary clearance, that means we remove all the uh, axillary lymph node, or we do sentinel lymph node. Unfortunately, here we don't do that, but the concept is simple. If we talk about the axilla, uh, the concept is simple. We inject a dye or a radioactive substance in the tumor area, and then we, uh, we go to the axilla, operate on the axilla. Either if we're using the radioactive material, we use a gamma detector probe to detect the lymph node, the first lymph node responsible for the drainage of the tumor and we remove it. If we use a dye, then we open the axilla and follow the dye till uh, we reach the first lymph node and we remove it, send it immediately to histopathology. If it is positive, then we proceed to, to clearance. If it is negative, then we shouldn't remove uh, the, the lymph node, the rest of the lymph nodes. Uh, the problem uh, accuracy is with the radioactive is very high, while in the dye it's very low. Uh, this will help to prevent the complication like lymphedema. Lymphedema with the clearance, it's around 20% or higher if it is very extensive surgery. Uh, in the sentinel lymph node, it's less than 5%, and uh, the, the survival is the same in both, uh, but it needs a frozen section histopathologist working with you, which is not available here. Okay, thank you. السلام عليكم طبعا الموضوع لو بنحكي على الاي اي طبعا انا مش يعني معلوماتي قد يكون ضئيله بالنسبه لسمبدي ايلس لكن نحن الموضوع لازم نتروه ونحكوا عليه لعل وعسل المرات الجايه يكون ان شاء الله في توك كبير عليه وناس تكون متخصصه واكسبرت في الموضوع هو الاي اي طبعا لا غنى على الديولوجيست ولا الهيومن باور لان اصلا الفيدنج المشينز ولا في دين كمبيوترايز بارت من ولا ديرن داتا ولا ديب ليرنينج هم الهيومن يعني اللي باش 
لما نحن نقول نقول احنا المشين هذه حتشتغل وتتكتنج الباثولوجي ما كيف حطت حطت لها لوت 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 اوف كيسز وتعلم عليها الميثولوجي سايد باش ان هي ايزي ديتكتد يعني معناها الباور الهيومن باور لغينا عليها شوف هو الموضوع طبعا انا بريست كانسر عاده هو الكومن كانسر عاده بين الهيومن وورد والي ديتكشن كيف ما قالوا زملائي من الدكتورة رحاب وكل يعني الناس عارفة الـ age detection improve الـ prognosis و reduce the death و أن الـ 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 التورة تقام في الـ عشان الكرسي وعشان الـ efficiency فلازم في improving للموضوع هذاهي من ضمن الـ AI طبعا الـ AI شو يدير؟ يساعد الـ diologist ويساعد الـ human أن هو saving time أن هو quick يعني improvement في الـ diagnosis أن حتى لان احنا في بالنسبه للاي في الراديولوجي بالذات في المثل في الماموجرام يعني هو يلقط الحاجات الصغيره بسرعه 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 فنخلي الراديولوجيست عنده وقت كفايه انه هو الحاجات الصعبه اللي بياخذ منه وقت زياده. بالنسبه للابلكيشن اوف اي اي ان بريست ايمجينج اوف ايمجين اناليسيس هو ديتكتنج اند كلاسيفيكاين سسبيشيس ليجنز اون ماموجرافي اند اندر بيست ميتاليتي او ايمجينج و ريس اسسمنت برضه اذا كان عندي داتا كويسه داخله في الموضوع معناها عندي الهيومن باور هو الاساسي بتتكتن ريسك اوف ديفلوبمنت اوف ريسك كانسر بيز اون بيشنت كاركترزيشن اند ايمجينج فايندينج و تريتمنت بلانينج برضه اوبتمزيشن اوبتمزايز ذا تريتمنت بلان بيز اون تشومر كاركترزيشن اند بيز اون بيشنت بريفرنس والكواليتي كنترولينج اللي انشورين ذا كريستي اند كونسيستنسي اوف ذا ريسك ايمجينج اكزامينيشن البنفيت اللي اوف اي ان بيست ايمجينج يعني اول شيء امبروفنج ديجنوستيك اكوريستي كان اسيست ريجست تو ديفاي سبتل اوف ريمانيتي ذات ماي بي ميس باي هومان اي انكريزنج افشنسي اي اي كان اوتوميتد ريبيتد في تاكسس فريينج ذا ريجست كما قلنا اون فوكس اون مور كومبلكس كيسز اند انهانسنج بيشن كير اي اي كان هيلب ريجست ميك مور انفورماتيف اون فورمال ديسيجن Uh, the uh, and more penalized treatment recommendation would reduce also cost. يعني ممكن ينقصنا من عدد الاكزامينشن اللي هي تتكرر بدون لازمه. I, I can potentially reduce the cost of the breast imaging examination and improving efficiency and reducing the need of repeated scan also a needed biopsy in نفس الوقت. Challenge of I, I in breast imaging data quality. الاي اي الالغوريثم ريلي اون هاي كواليتي داتا فور تريننج اند انترفير البياس يصير وين اي مودولز مودولز كان بي بياس اف تريند اون ذا داتا ذات از نوت ريبريزنتيف اوف ذا بوبليشن بين ستدي اكسبلينابيلتي ات كان بي ديفيكالت تو اندرستاند هاو اي اي مودولز ميك ديسيجن ويتش كان هندر ذير ادابت اند كلينيكال براكتيك ريجولاتي بروفل اي اي باور بريست ايمجينج تولز must meet regularity requirement to ensure, to, to ensure the patient safety and data privacy. Privacy. In the mammography, I started from the time, a decade ago, I remember when I was in the Urdu in 2014, the computer added detection كنت انا ابهرت يعني هو كان يحطه في قدامي على الورك ستيشن ويطلع كم نقطه هيك هيك وراهم انها هذه هي فيها الابنورمالتي انا كنت بين بينكم مستوى في الموضوع خضايا مش خاطر عليا في يوم من الايام نحن نوصلوا له يعني ماموجرافي واز وان اوف ذا فيرست ايمجينج موداليتي تو انكوربوريت اي اي تكنيك بين ود تراديشنال كمبيوتد اديد ديتكشن هو سي اي دي Computed at a detection system for mammography have been available for more a decade, meaning that the application of more recent machine deep learning technique to mammography already has a benchmark against which to compete. The early CAD, which is a system for screening related to machine learning with the human coded. Feature engineering and generally presented limited performance. شوف الأم الأم المامول جرام اللي عندي هذه إن شو إحنا ال ال إمج إي كان عندي سهم for suspicious lesion. والأدر كمان كانت normal classification وفي vascular classification. فال الهيومن يعني for overreading أحيانا 
ان هو شاف كل حاجه وعلق عليها الكروس ريد كروس هذا كان الاي اي اللي هو ديتكتد ريش انه هو فعلا هي كانت سبيشس اريا اللي هي فعلا طبعا الموضوع هذا هي هو يعني ينقص علينا الوقت والجهد كذلك future of AI or AI in breast imaging is expected to continue to play a major role in breast imaging, advance in machine learning, deep learning, and other AI technique will lead to even more powerful and versatile tools. AI and the human radiologists will work together to prove the best possible patient care. في الأكورسي أن هو first reading في الأم في الماما وهذا يعني ما في عليا دراسات فعشان كده دب reading دادة كانت دائما مطلوبة فتوسطنا على أن ممكن يكون بن radiologists reading ال 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 الماما وناظر reading by AI فلقوا أن ال sensitivity وال specificity one percent more with AI reading يعني. Conclusion, AI has a potential to revolutionizing breast imaging by improving diagnostic accuracy, efficiency, and patient care. By embracing AI, radiologists can improve their ability to detect breast cancer early and improve more personalized treatment recommendation. The future of the breast imaging is bright with AI playing a key role in improving better health care for women. We thank you for your attention. Uh, first of all, let's uh, change the way of uh, thinking. كلنا نفكروا في how to manage the breast cancer. لكن الأفضل إن نحنا نغير التوجه متاعنا ونفكروا في how to uh, early detect the breast cancer. Uh, I mean, uh, if you detect the breast cancer in, in the first stage, uh, you're going to have a very good result, excellent outcome. Uh, in this uh, uh, conference, I got this chance uh, to uh, present uh, the researches that are done in the, uh, in the Faculty of Medicine uh, regarding the breast cancer. Uh, يعني uh, um, تقريبا من سنتين أو ثلاث سنين فقط بدينا العمل الحقيقي في هذه الوحدة وبدأنا حقيقة في تحفيز أعضاء هي التدريس وطلب على إقامة البحوث. Uh, I enjoyed the presentation this morning, uh, دكتورة رحاب, دكتورة فايزة ودكتورة زينب. خصوصاً uh, البيبر بتاع الدكتور رحاب على المالتي ديسبرينيني أبروتش وأي هوب إن ماي لكتشر تغيّرت شوية في بعض الأشياء التي لا تذكرها لأنها لم تذكر البلاستيك والريكونستراكتيف سيرجن كمالتي ديسبرينيني تيم الذي هو مهم جداً أن البلاستيك سيرجن يكون موجود لأن الوقت بتاع السيرجري مهم جداً في الأول 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 I enjoyed the lecture of Dr. Zainab Maghrawi who was interested to see in one of her slides the plastic surgery techniques and how to achieve a good cosmetic results after lumpectomy. I enjoyed the lecture of Dr. Faiz on AI because we are doing fat grafting in the breast and it was a little bit challenging from the point of the radiologist or the first time of the fat grafting because there are calcifications and so on so we put on hold for a period of time and now back once everything was cleared and the radiologists were more familiar with identifying the calcifications from fat grafting versus breast cancer it's interesting to see how the AI is going to improve that in the near future كذلك انجويد البيبرز دكتور عثمان التجوري هو سوبرفايزر هو سوربرايزد على النمبرز وانا جست منشن تو هيم اف ذس از ا جود ابروش اند اف يو دونت نو يور نمبرز اف يو دونت ميجر ات يو كانت مانج ات سو اتس اولويز جود تو نو ذا نمبرز وهذا يعني ال 40% اتس بيج نمبر هذا ايفن ويز اوت سكريننج يعني اف يو هاف سكريننج واتس واتس جونا ذا نمبرز ويل بي فيري فيري هاي <تصفيق> أنا بس في نحب ننبهكم أنه في بعض الأدجستمنت من ناحية 
الكونسيكونسز بتاع الليكتشرز فانا درت ميرجينج للليكتشر بتاع الانكوبلاستيك ريكونستراكشن مع الفيرست ليكتشر هي الايفولوشن اوف بريست ريكونستراكشن فولوينج ماستكتومي I have no uh, conflict of interest. Uh, breast reconstruction has uh, evolved to the point where not only is a breast reconstruction important, but also a patient's entire body shape uh, now demands attention. Reconstructive options have expanded over the past 10 years and continue to expand. Uh, same thing for the mastectomy options uh, have expanded the last few years. Uh, also revisional surgery options have expanded and continue to expand. <coughs> As everybody knows, uh, breast cancer is the most common uh, uh, cancer among uh, women. Uh, the uh, mortality rate uh, continued to decrease because of early detection and uh, multimodal therapy, as the previous paper uh, explained that. Uh, in Canada, the five-year survival uh, for all stages of breast cancer is about 88%. The five-year uh, relative survival for stage zero and uh, one, uh, 100%. Uh, a little bit of history, uh, the first uh, radical mastectomy was performed by uh, William Halstead in 1889, and the first breast reconstruction was uh, performed in 1895 by a German professor who tried to reconstruct a, a breast on an actor by removing a lipoma from the flank uh, to the chest. In uh, 1963, uh, the invention of the silicon uh, gel implants, and in 82, uh, the introduction of tissue uh, expanders. In the 70s, you start seeing uh, flaps, so the flap, latissimus dorsi, musculocutaneous flap uh, developed, which is basically a, a flap of skin and muscle uh, from the patient's back to be used to cover the implant to reconstruct the breast. And the 82 uh, transverse rectus abdominis muscle, what's called the tram flap, uh, which uses a section of the uh, patient's lower abdomen, uh, skin and abdomen with the transverse uh, uh, rectus muscle and move up to uh, rebuild the breast after uh, mastectomy. In 89, uh, the development of the uh, discovery of a deep inferior epigastric periphery flap, which is basically a flap based on a skin and fat only without sacrificing uh, the muscle and transferred into the chest uh, uh, to rebuild the breast. In the 1980s, uh, 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 procedures for nipple reconstruction begin to appear in the literature. And the 86 introduction of tattooing uh, the reconstruct, to, reconstruct the, uh, nipple, uh, to reconstruct the nipple area complex. So basically, as everybody knows, uh, the uh, treatment of breast cancer is mainly surgical, either by uh, convention therapy, which is basically lumpectomy followed by radiation or mastectomy. In early stages, both options have equivalent long-term survival uh, and recurrence rate. Breast reconstruction following these procedures uh, have uh, shown improved patients' mental health, uh, sexual health, and overall satisfaction. Uh, as patients' expectations continue to grow, um, plastic surgeons are consistently uh, evolving their uh, operative techniques to achieve uh, better aesthetic and surgical outcome and limit complications. There are some advantages and disadvantages of uh, uh, breast conservation therapy. The main advantage is less surgery, day surgery, uh, faster recovery, uh, lower complication rate, uh, preserved sensation. However, uh, the disadvantage uh, can cause significant asymmetry, fibrosis, and malposition of the nipple area complex. So the, as everybody knows, the mastectomy can be radical mastectomy, modified radical mastectomy, skin-sparing mastectomy, or nipple-sparing mastectomy. So basically, the process is three steps. Uh, number one, resection, reconstruction, then revision. So we start with the resection, which is the mastectomy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it could be a traditional non-sparing mastectomy, non-skin-sparing mastectomy, or skin-sparing mastectomy, or nipple sparing mastectomy. This is a diagram just to show the traditional uh, mastectomy. This is a case uh, after uh, a complete mastectomy, you can see uh, uh, the transverse scar on the chest with a flat chest, multiple folds, uh, dog ears, significant a deformity, uh, asymmetry with the other side with large totic breast. And this uh, gives the patient difficult time with clothing uh, uh, hygiene and also uh, activities. 
This intraoperative picture showing a skin sparing uh, mastectomy. So basically the surgeon uh, removed the uh, nipple area complex with the breast uh, tissue, leaving the skin envelope behind for the plastic surgeon to do the reconstruction. And it's uh, the good candidate for that would be a small uh, to medium sized breast with a small to medium sized tumor. This picture showing intraoperative, uh, uh, this intraoperative picture showing uh, the inframammary approach for the nipple sparing mastectomy. So basically, uh, the surgeon removed the breast tissue uh, with the tumor, leaving the nipple area complex and the skin envelope behind. Um, the main advantage is uh, uh, leave a short scar and the inframammary fold, which is hidden scar, and improve sensation to the nipple and uh, it has superior aesthetic outcome. The only disadvantage is a little bit challenging for the surgeon to do the nipple sparing mastectomy uh, with this approach and also a little bit challenging for the reconstructive surgeon, especially if we're doing a free flap uh, to reach the perforator and do the anastomosis. This diagram is just to show the importance of the perforators that are arising from the internal mammary vessels. When I started my practice working with the general surgeon, we just start to know each other. I always put my finger on that, uh, on those peripheries, so it does, the scalpel doesn't pass beyond the <laughs> my fingers. So if you, if, you, if you go there, you have to cut my finger. So this is very important to uh, preserve the vascularity of the skin uh, uh, flap. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the, the, the last thing that you want to have is a skin necrosis um, after mastectomy. Uh, this diagram is just to show you uh, uh, the uh, uh, reconstructed uh, breast with the DIP free flap from the lower abdomen and you can see the skin island at the bottom of the breast uh, with the uh, vessel uh, hooked into the internal memory uh, vessel. These are the type of mastectomy incisions. Uh, depends on the uh, uh, type of mastectomy. So you have the circumarial uh, 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 mastectomy. For the nipple uh, sparing mastectomy, you can do the vertical or the transverse. Uh, for the skin sparing mastectomy, you can do the vertical or the wise pattern. Uh, to, uh, it depends on the size of the breast. <clears throat> the timing of the breast reconstruction uh, could be immediate, which means uh, at the same time after resection of the tumor, or it could be delayed uh, uh, after a few uh, months or years after the resection of the tumor. The advantages of uh, the immediate reconstruction is basically a single operation, so it's a collaboration between the surgeon and the plastic surgeon. So the surgeon does the mastectomy part, the plastic surgeon at the same time, if they're doing free flap, harvest the flap at the same time. And uh, it has a better cosmetic outcome, and decrease overall complications. The disadvantage sometimes it delay uh, the uh, uh, mastectomy, that's why we meet in the uh, multidisciplinary uh, meetings to uh, see our schedules and try to collaborate and try to minimize the window within six weeks. Um, occasionally might delay uh, chemotherapy or radiation uh, if complications uh, occurred. Uh, the advantage of the delayed reconstruction is allow the mastectomy, uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy to be completed without any delay and also will give the patient options uh, time to think about options of reconstruction uh, so there's no stress, there's no stress about the timing to reach, uh, uh, you know, within six weeks you have to make your decision so they have some time to think about the type of reconstruction. The disadvantage is uh, the patient will have uh, a long uh, ugly scar as you saw in the previous pictures um, and that will remind them with the uh, journey of the breast cancer and it has a psychological stress um, and also a clothing uh, problem. And it has a little bit of slightly uh, high uh, co combined complication rate when compared with the immediate. The reconstruction phase, um, so why patients choose to have breast reconstruction? When I see patients in my clinic after a delayed mastectomy, uh, after mastectomy, they always complain about the prosthesis. So they use a prosthesis to help them to fit their clothes. So that prosthesis, especially in the summertime, it's hot. Uh, clumsy and they have to carry this prosthesis everywhere when they go to the beach, to the, uh, going to a, a, a social event, they have to put that, so it's, 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 not, uh, it's not comfortable. Um, also the scar remind them with the uh, uh, breast cancer and has a psychological uh, uh, impact uh, with depression. Uh, most of these patients, they're in, in, in antidepressants and anti-anxiety. 
and also the feeling of losing uh, femininity and adverse effect on the sexual life and, and the relationships, uh, and also the, addition, the uh, issue with the clothing. So basically, the options of recon breast reconstruction uh, and under two main categories are the time and the type of reconstruction. The time, if it's immediate versus delayed, or autologous, which is mean using your own tissue, or alloplastic using a device which is called an implant, or combined by using the own tissue to cover the implant. So what you see here, it's the list of the autologous breast reconstruction. I'm gonna focus more on the most common uh, donor site, which is the abdomen. So the pedicle tram basically is the transverse rectus abdominis uh, flap. It's pedicle means the blood supply is still attached to the flap and you move it from the abdomen. The reason that we choose the abdomen as the, uh, the primary site because most of women have a little bit of redundancy in their abdomen and they will like it if you remove that extra tissue, it's like a free tummy tuck. Um, so that's the main reason why we're choosing uh, this tissue. The free tram, it's the same thing, but you, can, you know, take the flap, which is basically skin, soft tissue, uh, subcutaneous fat, and the transverse rectus uh, muscle with the blood vessels, and you move them up to the chest and do microsurgery to uh, anastomose the, uh, the vessels together to rebuild the breast. The DIP free flap, it's basically the name of the vessel, which is basically the deep inferior epigastric perforator. Perforator means that the vessel perforate the muscle to reach uh, the skin. Uh, the SIAE, it's the name of the vessel, it's called the uh, superficial uh, inferior epigastric uh, uh, flap. And the pedicle latissimus dorsi flap. The other three free flaps is basically from other areas. If the woman is not a good candidate uh, for abdominal donor site, let's say if she's very thin patient, or she had multiple scars from multiple surgeries. So basically, she's not a good candidate for this uh, flap from the abdomen. So the tug flap, mm -hmm. it's the uh, uh, transversus upper gracilis flap. It's from the inner thigh. And the is uh, gap flap is the superior mm -hmm. gluteal artery perforator mm -hmm. flap from the upper buttock. And the I gap flap is the inferior uh, gluteal uh, artery perforator flap from the lower buttock. And then uh, fat transfer, which is a hot topic for plastic surgeon for the last few years uh, right now. Then we move to the other options, is the alloplastic breast reconstruction. So this can be done in two stages or in one stage. Um, initially, when this started, it started as a two stages procedure. So basically the first stage, uh, you put the expander, and then after that, in a second stage, you replace the expander with the implant. Um, the, as I mentioned, the most common uh, donor site for the uh, uh, autologous reconstruction is the abdomen, uh, which could be pedicle flap or free flap. This diagram showing the tram uh, flap, the pedicle tram flap, so you can see um, the tissue is harvested from the lower abdomen. The blood vessel is still attached to the superior epigastric uh, vessel and you take uh, the, the rectus abdominis muscle and you move it up and then the surgeon reconstruct the abdominal wall with the, uh, with the mesh and uh, <clears throat> move the flap up to reconstruct the breast, uh, this uh, skin sparing uh, mastectomy. This is a 36 year old uh, lady after mastectomy and radiation. Uh, she came to my office seeking for breast reconstruction so you can see here the radiation effect. Is anybody from radiation oncology here? Nobody. So uh, 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 this is uh, the uh, issue with radiation, has significant impact on the tissue. Um, and you can see the full transverse scar and she also has a large totic uh, breast. This is a bleak view and side view. This is the preoperative planning before surgery. So I do my marking, mark the lower abdomen, uh, divided by zones. This is the zones for um, uh, blood supply. This is the rectus abdominis muscle that I'm gonna use to uh, reconstruct this part. This is my marking for the uh, breast footprint and the uh, try to uh, do some modification to achieve some uh, upper uh, 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 breast uh, fullness. 
This is her after complete reconstruction. So this is the flap that I used from her lower abdomen. It moved up and then she also had a, a nipple reconstruction in a, another uh, local, under local anesthetic in another procedure. So this is the front view, oblique view and side view. Another case, 29 year old lady, just focus on the ages, very young ladies. Uh, same procedure, um, she uh, underwent the same type of uh, reconstruction. The deep inferior epigastric peripheral flap, so this diagram shows the difference between the DIEP free flap and the rectus. So you can see the blood vessel here when you do the pedicle tram, you, you use the muscle so you sacrifice the rectus abdominis uh, flap. So you need to... Uh, uh, put a mesh to reconstruct the abdominal. The uh, disadvantage of that sometimes uh, patients come back with bulges uh, or if there's failure of the mesh, they come in with the hernia. Um, the, and that's the main advantage of the deep inferior epigastric peripheral flap. It's basically you only dissect through the muscle, find the vessel, and you continue until you get to the uh, bottom of the inferior epigastric vessel and then harvest only the vessel, skin, and uh, subcutaneous fat. Uh, here in your left side is a diagram showing the split of the rectus abdominis muscle. This is the perforator and here it's a, this is an intraoperative picture showing the perforators emerging from the fascia of the rectus abdominis and this is the skin and the subcutaneous fat. This is a closer picture showing the small tiny perforators. We're talking about one to two millimeter in diameter. And here this is the retractor retracting the rectus abdominis uh, to the side. And here you see the perforator. This is the nerve that gives the innervation to the muscle. So you try to uh, preserve that nerve. So you dissect. It's a technically demanding procedure. It takes some time. So you be very carefully dissect these tiny vessels and go all the way down to, to the end of the, of the vessel. And then you harvest the flap. This is the flap after harvesting the, uh, the flap. So this is the flap. This is the pedicle. Then we move it up to the chest and the chests. This is the skin sparing mastectomy. The surgeon completed the mastectomy. We go in, harvest, uh, remove the usually the third costal cartilage to expose the internal mammary vessel. And these are the vessels that we use for microsurgery to um, anastomose the internal mammary vessel to the pedicle. And this is after anastomosis under microscope uh, with microsurgery. This is an intraoperative picture showing uh, my colleague doing the uh, uh, mastectomy uh, and the inframemory approach. This is me here harvesting the flap on the other side. So it's a teamwork. We're working together at the same time. And this is after completion of the mastectomy. This is the same patient uh, six weeks after surgery. So you can see uh, this island, skin island. This is from the uh, flap, this uh, for monitoring the flap. And this is her after uh, uh, six weeks after reconstruction. Another patient, similar procedures. So this is before. Uh, this is six weeks after uh, a reconstruction. This is uh, three months after nipple reconstruction and tattooing. Another patient with bilateral um, uh, skin sparing mastectomy and reconstruction with uh, 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 DIP free flap. Uh, this is a delayed case, same thing. The superficial inferior epigastric artery free flop, it's basically the same idea. The only advantage of this, there is no need to go through the erectus abdominis muscle. So the vessel is superficial, so it's based on the superficial system. And uh, the only problem, it's only available is about 30% of patients. So usually when you start the dissection, we start to find these vessels. If we feel that the vessel is very, very small, is not uh, good for anastomosis, we stop there and then we move to the DIP free. If it's in good size, we continue our dissection, harvest the flap without sacrificing the uh, rectus abdominis muscle. This is the flap on the back table after harvesting the flap. This is the, the, the artery and the vein. The latissimus dorsi uh, uh, pedicled uh, musculocutaneous flap, it's basically a flap based on the uh, back of the patients, harvesting the latissimus dorsi muscle with an island of the flap. We try to make this island and the bra line. So when you remove the flap, the scar is within the bra line, so it's hidden within the bra line. And then you move it to the front to reconstruct the breast. The only issue with that, the muscle is very thin, so it's not enough to rebuild the breast. So we have to use an implant, 
Um, so it's a good option of the patient going for radiation, so at least you have a well vascularized tissue uh, to cover the implant to minimize the radiation effect. Uh, this is an example of latissimus dorsi uh, reconstruction before, after, and this is showing the scar in, uh, in this, uh, and the uh, mid axillary line instead of the back. Uh, another lady, this was a very challenging case, she was obese and she uh, decided to go with this procedure. So she had the same uh, thing, reconstruction, lip reconstruction, and uh, symmetry procedure, breast reduction to achieve symmetry. This is the scar on her back. Uh, we move to the tissue expander. So the tissue expander basically is to recreate the skin envelope after uh, mastectomy. It's a, it's a long journey. It takes uh, four to six uh, months uh, to complete the surgery. So it's basically two surgeries, multiple office visits. This is a disadvantage. And uh, in terms of the tissue expander, you can use either temporary tissue expander or permanent. Uh, this is just a diagram to show the uh, dissection. So we basically create a pocket under the pectoralis uh, muscle. Uh, for the expander, then you put the expander uh, in the uh, uh, pocket. This is my nurse doing the expansion phase after two weeks of the uh, reconstruction. So the patient come to the office and she start injecting the expander with, 10, with 50 to 100 cc or until you reach the, you know, the patient start to feel pain and then you stop uh, expansion. Um, this is a case example. This is uh, before. Uh, this is at the end of the expansion phase. Then I did uh, breast reduction to achieve symmetry. And this is after completion of the second stage uh, with the replacement of the expander with the implant and doing a nipple reconstruction. This is another case, uh, same thing. The only difference, she decided to not to have nipple reconstruction. Instead of that, she put a, a, a tattooing to cover her scars. Uh, and this to, just to know how bad that you know, affect the patients, the scar, remind them with really, uh, she said, you know what, I can't even, when I, every time when I look at them into the mirror and see the scar, um, I just start to cry. So she decided to cover the entire area with a tattooing. And then she had a mastopixy to achieve symmetry. Another example, uh, this is bilateral, um, very disfiguring uh, mastectomy, uh, folds, just you can see even the border, the pectoralis muscle here. Uh, so this is at the end of the uh, first stage after the expansion. This is after completion of uh, reconstruction. Uh, and even you can see the patient gained weight after reconstruction. So she's very more comfortable in her body. Then uh, we'll talk about immediate direct to implant reconstruction, which is basically uh, this emerged after the uh, development of the uh, what's called the uh, 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 acellular or dermal matrix uh, in 2001. Uh, so basically, this is a cadaveric sheet uh, that has undergone uh, thousands of the process of sterilization and uh, 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 deep and uh, removal of the cells. Initially, this sheet was just a blank sheet, like a square. When we start using, so basically, the idea is to use that sheet to support the implant when you do the uh, immediate reconstruction. The problem when they start doing this in the 70s without this. They, so basically the surgeon removed the breast tissue, putting the implant, they had issues with skin necrosis, complication, so they put this in hold, and that's why they start doing the two stages of reconstruction. But after emerging of this product, this helped to support the implant and uh, prevent the uh, skin necrosis and also help also after radiation to um, uh, protect the implant. Initially, when the plastic surgeons started using this sheet, they start to cover the entire implant uh, 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 360, so the front, the back. But this piece of, of product is very, very expensive. It's about $2,500. So we had issues with the hospitals to convince them to use this. And then we start to think outside the box. Do we need to cover the entire implant? Let's try to cover just the only the outer portion of the implant. And then after that, nowadays, I'd only cover the lower two-third of the implant, um, uh, and I had a very successful result. And then the other thing, you can see the shape. It's, it's a contour shape. So I say, why, why we need a square, big square shape? We don't, and then because we ended up cutting these two pieces, and it's a waste of product. So we asked the this plastic surgeon who involved in this research, they asked the company, to change the shape to make it more modified, more practical, so the would be uh, will cost less and less. 
And then the perforation, the reason because uh, it's a foreign body, when you put it, it creates a lot of seroma. So they notice that, you know, a patient come back with seroma after removing the drains. So they used, initially they used to put two drains, one below the, uh, the, the product, one above, and there are two drains coming out. And now they say, okay, let's uh, make a little holes. And then after this, okay, they ask the company to, do, to make it a perforator. So now it's called perforated contoured uh, ADM. So this is a diagram to show you uh, what I've explained earlier. So this is, uh, initially it's, it started uh, with the immediate diagram to put the implant under the muscle. The idea, the whole thing is to protect the implant. And in case of you have skin necrosis, so at least you have a muscle coverage there uh, so you don't have exposure to the implant. The second thing is to protect it from radiation if the patient requires radiation because when you do the, re the mastectomy, we don't know exactly about the margins. So if the margins came back positive, then the patient has to you know, go for radiation. So this basically has a protective layer to, uh, to protect the implant. The problem with that is um, the patient come back with what's called animation deformity. Every time when they move their arms, the implant boop, comes up down, up, and it's very, very, very uncomfortable. So uh, then after that, I start to thinking about putting the implants above the muscle. Say, well, this is where the breast should be. The breast tissue was above the muscle, not under the muscle. So we should put the implant above the muscle. That's why they start to cover the entire uh, implant with the, uh, with the uh, alloderm. <clears throat> so this is a diagram showing the uh, subpictorial versus the prepictorial. So the subpictorial, you raise the pic muscle, you put the implant, and then you sew the uh, dermal, uh, a the ADM into the lower edge of the pictoralis muscle. The prepictorial, you just put the implant, and then you put the, uh, as I mentioned, I, now I just cover the lower two-thirds of the implant. The indication for immediate direct to implant is uh, the ideal patient for that is rel uh, uh, with uh, relatively small breasts without significant comorbidities. So not every patient is good candidate for this procedure. Uh, the relative contraindication is obesity, uh, large breasts, uh, smoking history, and previous uh, radiation. This is intraoperative uh, picture showing the nipple sparing mastectomy, and you can see this is the sheet of the ADM uh, covering the lower two-thirds of the implant. This is the implant. Uh, this is a case example of a bilateral skin sparing mastectomy with immediate direct-to-implant prepictoral approach uh, with ADM. This is another example of bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy with pre-pectoral direct to implant reconstruction. And this is also another uh, skin sparing mastectomy with a pre-pectoral direct to implant after, and uh, nipple reconstruction. This lady here, I did a breast reduction and then two years later she came in with breast cancer on her left side. So uh, she uh, underwent a nipple sparing mastectomy uh, followed by direct to implant reconstruction. If this lady did not have a breast reduction, she may not be a good candidate for this procedure. So uh, you can see the, uh, this type of reconstruction is stable, uh, soft, feels more natural, and uh, pain-free. Um, this lady has the left skin uh, sparing mastectomy, prepictural direct to uh, implant, and uh, rebalancing procedure on the right side. Uh, this is a video showing the, uh, uh, the no animation deformity after moving her chest. Okay, so squeeze your muscles, try to squeeze your arm like this. And so you can see the aim, implant is not moving. Another patient. Okay, yeah. Relax. Relax. A little bit of movement, but not too bad. If this patient, these patients had the pre the uh, subpictorial, the implant will move up significantly after movement. Uh, talk about uh, free fat grafting, uh, which is now uh, considered uh, most of the uh, very important procedure for revisional surgery after reconstruction. So basically, free fat grafting is um, uh, harvesting the fat uh, from the most common donor site, from the abdomen or the inner thighs, and then process the fat and then re-inject it to uh, 
uh, treat irregularities or deformities uh, after reconstruction. So basically the process is harvesting, processing, and then uh, injecting. Um, so now, nowadays we use fat grafting for both cosmetic uh, to improve the volume of the breast and also for reconstruction. The reconstruction is a little bit different uh, because when you have a lumpectomy defect, for example, uh, you need to respect the space and the scar. You know, there's a lot of scar tissue, so you can't just go in and inject fat. You have to create a space for that. And also need to respect the fat graft because the fat graft is like seeds. You know, you take it, it's like a free graft, so it has to attach to, you know, blood vessel to survive. And the survival rate for fat grafting is between 30 to, um, uh, minimum, like maximum 30 to 50 percent. Most of the fat will just go away, disappear. Um, and uh, the most important thing, uh, use a closed system for sterility. I use this, this is my nurse, uh, scrub nurse, doing the, uh, uh, this is called the Revolve, which is basically a device. You inject the fat and then you wash it with multiple time with saline and then you uh, extract the fat and then inject it with cannulas and small uh, syringes. Um, so basically when you inject the fat, it has, it's a little bit uh, technically demanding procedure, so it has to be in a very small, like one cc syringes. Uh, there are different types mm -hmm. of cannulas, depends on the, the, the tissue that you're going to use. And uh, you have to inject and slowly go out and, and, and then lay down the fat. So it has to be a very, very thin layer in order to capture the blood vessel and survive. And that's why when you see the patient, uh, the most important thing is during the consent process mm -hmm. to explain to them that don't expect that you're going to see an immediate result after the, uh, the, the fat grafting, and it may need more than two or three sessions to achieve a reasonable result. Uh, this is um, a prospective randomized uh, conversion of clinical outcomes with different processing techniques of autologous fat grafting, which is level uh, two evidence paper. Uh, among us as a plastic surgeon, we always debate about how we're going to process the fat. Some of them use what's called the centrifusion. It's like they use for platelets extraction. And some of them, they use the revolve. And some of them just, uh, you know, put the fat on a sheet of paper and just uh, let it uh, uh, dry. And then, so there are different techniques. So this uh, paper showed there is no uh, significant, uh, uh, there's no, um, uh, in terms of the survival of the fat or complication, there's no difference between the three techniques. Uh, this patient is um, a 32-year-old lady who had uh, lumpectomy in a very difficult location to reconstruct. It's in the medial side, um, a lot of uh, indentation, and she had also radiation. Um, so there's a lot of fibrosis. Uh, so we talked about uh, fat grafting, and as I mentioned, I explained to her, don't expect that your breast is going to be back to normal. Uh, it's a process, going to take a few sessions. Uh, I, I can't promise you that you're going to have a, a good result, but at least we'll aim for a reasonable, um, uh, uh, try to uh, decrease the deformity. So this is a preoperative planning. So this is the side of the uh, donor side. And this is my marking, try to uh, expand this area. So intraoperatively, I went in, I used an 18 gauge needle, uh, it's called rigotomy. So basically you go in and just uh, try to release the fibrosis gently without uh, doing any trauma to the tissue to create a space for the fat. And then after that, I harvest the fat. Uh, I don't use liposuction machine because this creates a, a, a shearing force so that this may kill the fat. So you have to uh, harvest the fat with a, a slow negative pressure to try to maximize the survival of the fat cells. And then you re-inject it into the space slowly and gently and just like a thin layers, try to capture the, uh, the uh, blood supply. This is her after three sessions of fat grafting. So you can see there's significant improvement of the defects. So you don't see that indentation anymore. Um, it's uh, uh, softer. Um, uh, as I mentioned, is not going to be back to a normal breast, but at least she's happy. Uh, she said, you know, at least I don't see that indentation anymore, and it's softer, it feels a little bit normal. Uh, this is the side view. You can see the difference here between um, uh, before uh, and after. Oncoplastic uh, breast uh, conservation therapy. So the idea uh, emerged in 1998 by basically is to 
for small tumors do the lumpectomy, mm -hmm. but in the same time to, to move tissue around to uh, try to achieve a good shape uh, uh, of the breast. Uh, so the, uh, basically um, uh, it can be divided into a volume displacement or volume replacement. Um, the uh, volume displacement basically is redistribution of the uh, tissue after mastectomy to fill up the defect and it could be uh, subdivided into two levels. Level one, which is uh, less than 20% of uh, tissue removed, or level two, which is basically from 20 to 50% of tissue removed. Um, volume replacement, if the tissue removed is more than 50%, so you have to take tissue from somewhere else to do the reconstruction. So the timing, uh, same thing, it could be immediate, delayed immediate, or delayed. So immediate, basically the same, same session. Uh, delayed immediate, so the patient, you know, do the, the lumpectomy and then uh, wait for the margins to come back. If it's negative, then we go back and do the, uh, the reconstruction. Delayed, this means that, you know, the patient had the lumpectomy and came back after a few months or years uh, and do the delayed. Uh, this is a, an intraoperative uh, picture showing uh, uh, after lumpectomy, uh, the, look, the tumor was located in the upper quadrant uh, 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 invasive ductal carcinoma. After lumpectomy, the specimen was about 250 uh, grams. Um, so basically, uh, remove the tumor and do the pedicle. This is the pedicle where the nipple area complex and uh, there's the extension of the tissue to move it up to reconstruct the defect. Uh, this is a case example, a 48-year-old lady who had left uh, breast cancer. She underwent a uh, lumpectomy, and the same time we did uh, the uh, oncoplastic procedure, and did also the main advantage, you do, asymm you do a symmetrical procedure to the other side. This is her after radiation. See how bad the radiation can do to the breast. That's almost the entire breast is burned. And this is her three months after radiation. So. She still have a reason, you can see there's a shrinking of the nipple area complex because of the effect of the radiation and fibrosis, but she had reasonable uh, symmetry and volume of the breast. This is a 58-year-old lady with a delayed uh, uh, replace, uh, a tissue displacement. Uh, you can see the defect in a very difficult location is the inferior pool of the breast with indentation with asymmetry of the nipple, and this is her after the uh, procedure. With volume replacement, then you need to uh, think about other uh, side uh, outside the uh, breast to move tissue around to replace the more than 50% of defect. And you can uh, use the lateral intercostal artery periphery flap or the anterior intercostal artery periphery flap or the thoracodorsal uh, artery periphery flap. And this is an intraoperative uh, picture showing uh, moving this uh, flap from the side of the chest and shift it to the defect to fill up the, uh, the defect. So in conclusion, no plastic surgery techniques have seen more evolution over the past 30 years as breast re uh, reconstruction. Uh, breast reconstruction has significantly improved the quality of life for women after breast cancer treatment, and we call the close the loop in breast cancer management. Uh, the concept of modern surgery has evolved from signs that deal with a disease to treat to a patient to cure. Um, in which aim to provide a patient with the greatest degree of satisfaction with a short uh, possible time and less complications. Um, you were thinking about how to educate our people about breast cancer. In 2016, was a, uh, we, did, we had the same issue about breast reconstruction. There are many patients don't know their options about breast reconstructions. So there's a, a Canadian plastic surgeon uh, who uh, came up with this idea. It's called the Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. It's called the Bra Day. Uh, usually happen October 21st. Uh, uh, this was 2016. This is me giving a lecture in the news. Actually, obviously, nobody read the newspaper these days. Everybody knew the news in your phone. So this is very old. Um, so basically, the, uh, what we start doing is to um, educate patients about breast reconstruction. It's the same idea about breast cancer. So uh, we start sending emails, let's say, with collaboration with uh, general surgeons, 
any patient diagnosed with breast cancer, send them emails. We say, hey, we have this session on October 21st. Come in, it's free. Just come, listen about your options, about the breast cancer. So the session basically, it's a, like an evening session, few hours uh, between me and the general surgeon. So the general surgeon give uh, lectures like you guys did this morning about breast cancer to educate the patients. And then I give lecture about breast reconstruction. And then we have a private room. Uh, let's say I uh, ask and take a consent from a few of my patients who had different options of breast reconstructions and they uh, stay in the private room and this room only accessible for patients who are going for breast cancer treatment and thinking about reconstruction and go into the room and uh, there are sessions like uh, exam you know tables and uh, every patient there's no names for confidentiality reasons so I put a patient number one and you write in a piece of paper, this patient had a breast reconstruction with a tram flap, the second patient had breast reconstruction with a, a direct to implant, the other patient with a fat graft. So there are different options. The patient who are uh, thinking about reconstruction come in, go to the room and talk to these patients. So number one, they show them the results, they talk to them, they tell them their story, and they get more involved in education. So it's more active education rather than just, you know, sitting and giving lectures. And these patients, they're overwhelmed with information. Like they see the general surgeon, they see the oncologist, they see the radiation oncologist, they see the plastic surgeon. So there's a lot of information in their heads and they get confused. How I'm gonna, de how I'm gonna decide? So this uh, uh, idea is to kind of relieve the stress on the patient and talk to the patient who have the same scenario and, uh, and help them to make their decision. And every patient is different. Every patient has you know, different uh, social life. Uh, you know, we live in a multicultural uh, country, so there are different uh, cultures, different uh, thinking, uh, different body types. So all these decisions is very difficult to, to achieve. So it's the same thing you guys were thinking about how we can educate our people. I think maybe just an idea is to create a cancer society. And it's, uh, you know, um, with active women who are uh, being diagnosed. I'm sure there are some active women who are diagnosed with breast cancer. They get involved in this society um, and uh, they involved in the education. I hear that issues with uh, getting permission to get to, to the school. Maybe this society can have an exceptional permission to go to the school and give education. So this is the first uh, part. So the single stage direct to implant reconstruction is, um, uh, they did a study in that and when compared to tissue expander, they found this option is better than doing two stages. And breast reconstruction, uh, now we talk about breast reconstruction and quality of life. This is the last uh, topic. Uh, there are many studies on that and that has uh, uh, showed that uh, mastectomy uh, uh, caused trauma and patients are very depressed and not happy with their life. Um, and uh, this has proven with a study that has uh, psychological changes and uh, depression and, and issues with, uh, with uh, society. Um, the breast reconstruction and uh, uh, quality of life have been measured many times, different research studies. And uh, they, sh they show that half of all women who undergone mastectomy uh, perceived negative self-image and experienced negative change in their social, personal, and sexual relationship. Um, women, especially the young women, um, who very uh, care about their physical appearance, carries more significant breast, uh, uh, breast reconstruction and favor forms, and the, the breast reconstruction should be considered, especially in young uh, women. Uh, so this basically, um, in the United States, because of the importance of this topic, um, they uh, ensured the procedure for breast reconstruction in 1998. Um, so it's covered by their medical care. As you know, in the United States, it's, uh, it's a private uh, care, but with certain procedure they ensured, one of them is the reconstruction, breast reconstruction. This followed by 2001, an additional legislation imposing uh, penalties 
on non-compliant insurers. So, for example, if an insurance company denied uh, covering uh, uh, breast reconstruction, uh, they're going to apply penalty on this insurance company. And then uh, similar uh, provisions for coverage exist in most countries worldwide. In Canada, it's fully covered uh, through uh, national health care programs. In 2015, in the USA, the Breast Cancer Patient Act, which informed women of their right to breast reconstruction under federal law. So it's a law. It's, you, it's, it's a must to educate your patient about breast reconstruction. So in conclusion, breast reconstruction in this setting of post-mastectomy radiation therapy has higher incidence of complications. The multidisciplinary approach, I wish that Dr. Rehab Shanib is here, uh, and hopefully maybe in her next presentation she put the plastic surgeon and the primary member for the multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, it's a crucial, very important for the plastic surgeon to be in this team to discuss the timing of reconstruction, because as we know, uh, there is a, a, a very uh, narrow window that try to do the, uh, the procedure within six weeks, so the coordination has to be done within that six weeks. <clears throat> because there is no level one evidence and uh, indication for the optimal treatment strategy, a well-informed patient about both benefits and involved risk is essential. So during the consultation with the patient, uh, it's very important to explain everything to the patient and to give them time to think and let them decide. Women with no successful breast reconstruction were significantly more satisfied, uh, sorry, with successful breast reconstruction are more, more significantly uh, satisfied with the appearance of their chest breast and has significantly improved quality of life uh, for women after breast cancer treatments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.